come on. I know he was only exposed to it for a second, but there is no way Ash Tyler comes out looking that handsome, having been in the vacuum of space. <laughs> Hello interwebs and welcome to my ongoing retro review series of Star Trek Picard's Star Trek Picard? Star Trek Discovery Season 1 being done in preparation for Star Trek Discovery's fifth and final season premiering later this year. Actually in less than a month, which means I am so pumped y'all. We're gonna see my girl Sonequa Martin-Green kicking some ass, doing, doing, some, doing some Star Trek shit. It's gonna be a fun time. And actually uh, on that note, I just want to shout out uh, the Star Trek YouTube channel. And I'm not doing this as a promotion with them. I just found this fascinating. The Star Trek uh, YouTube channel did a wonderful conversation between uh, Tawny Newsom and Sonequa Martin-Green that I really, really loved. It was they're, they're both just lovely people. I've never met Sonequa Martin-Green, but I can tell you from personal experience that Tawny is one of the like brightest and kindest human beings that I've ever met. And their conversation was just so warm, so kind. It was actually just really awesome to see two black women just getting to like talk at each other about the difficulties that they faced in their career, but also the joys and, and what it means to be in Star Trek and, and just just talking as actors. I don't know. It was, just, it was a really wonderful video that I highly recommend people go check out if you haven't. Um, like I said, I, I'm not getting, I'm not a shill for anything. I just thought it was a really lovely conversation between, between two lovely people. But with that said, let's actually talk about uh, this week's episode, and that is going to be The World Inside from Season 1. Honestly, I had mainly forgotten this episode existed, with the first episode and the last two episodes of the Mirror Universe arc that focused on Michelle Yeoh's Emperor being the ones that come foremost to my mind. But surprisingly, the world inside is incredibly strong despite it sadly not having had enough time to delve into its cool ideas before moving on. This episode is mainly concerned with themes of performativity and connection, building upon this entire season's themes of asking the question, do we become what we enact, or is there a world inside? Eh? that survives no matter what the world tries to force us to be. I know, there's no queer themes here. I don't know what you're talking about. But this episode focuses in on how we find and hold on to our true selves, and that's by finding connections to and seeing the personhood of others. And the episode mainly discusses these ideas through three storylines, Stemets, Burnham's, and Tylet's. Burnham's is the one most explicitly tied to this theme, with the episode's opening monologue having her discuss her fear at pretending to be the fascist mirror universe Captain Burnham and worrying that it has influenced who she actually is. That by pretending to be this fascist, that it has made her become one. Can you continue to pretend to be one of them? Even as little by little, it kills the person you really are. These ideas tie nicely into Judith Butler's philosophy of performativity, something that we often discuss in terms of the concept of gender and how we enact gender in our everyday life, but it also easily applies here as well. Society and our social constructs are only made real by our performance of them, and so what we perform as a group thereby makes it real. So if you are not performing your true self, if you are not enacting in the world who you see yourself to be, the question really is, is that the real you? This is the question that Burnham is grappling with as she enacts the horrors of fascism around the world upon her, as we see in the opening montage. Ash Tyler presents the episode's second theme, how you are able to hold on to your true self by performing yourself even in the small moments with those that you care about. This theme is brought up when Tyler tells a symbolic story about a spatial tether from his academy days. They're mandatory the first few times a cadet goes out in the Navy and they link you back to what you know, what you love. I hope you stay strong even as you're headed out into that terrifying abyss. This is an interesting story for Tyler to tell, given that we know it's a false memory that has been implanted in him, which means the question has been flipped on us. Tyler's connection to Burnham is what changes him from being Voke into becoming Ash Tyler, changing his performance of self by enacting it with someone else. So, if Tyler can be changed from a radicalized Klingon into a Federation officer, does this mean that Burnham might be turned into a fascist as well by performing fascist actions? And the answer to this lies again in connection, for Burnham has no real connection to any of the fascist Terran Empire crew members on her ship, only bonding with the Mirror Universe Saru, who she gives a name and treats with respect despite him being a slave. I'm gonna call you Saru, in honor of a respected friend. Yes, Captain. Naming someone allowing them to find their own identity? Yep, d definitely zero queer or trans themes in, in Star Trek Discovery at all. 
But ultimately, it's Burnham's connection to those that she cares about, not these fascist Terrans who don't let anyone in, that saves her true heart. That all being said, and aside here, one thing I do hate about this episode is why did we have to put Sonequa Martin-Green in sexy lingerie for a single scene? Like, I get that Burnham is in the fascist, bisexual, every lady must show off her midriff universe, and also that Martin-Green is freaking gorgeous, but it feels exploitative and male gazy of the show to do this. There could be some commentary here about how the camera positions us as the viewer to objectify Burnham as a woman, connecting to the episode's themes of personhood, connection, and performance, but I really doubt that the show had such high-minded ideals when it put Sonequa Martin-Green in a sexy outfit. Speaking of criticisms as well, I've already talked about this enough in other episodes, but we do get another montage of Tyler's PTSD flashbacks here in greater detail, with a ton of body horror and sexual violence imagery, as well as Klingon boobs. And this element of his story and these visuals feel exploitative and needlessly R-rated in order to justify this being a streaming adult Star Trek show. I'm certainly not against having body horror or sexual violence imagery depicted within a show, but if you do it, you should use it with more intentionality than Discovery is doing here, where it seems to just underline what we already know about Tyler, that he's messed up in the head, and not using this imagery or these themes to explore that with any depth or specificity other than to just say, oh, look how messed up he is because of all this horrific PTSD stuff. Moving on to more positives, though, I do love that Burnham is set up to destroy a coalition of aliens fighting the Terran Empire, led by a Klingon who we later learn is the Mirror Universe version of Ash Tyler slash Vogue. On just a nerd Trekkie level, this coalition feels like not only a great follow-up to the Vulcan-led revolution from Star Trek Enterprise's Amir Darkly episodes, but also a prelude to the klingon cardassian alliance that we see eventually overthrows the Terran Empire in Deep Space Nine. I also love Burnham going to ask Lorca for advice, who tries to convince her to kill the Resistance in order to protect their cover. But I can't send hundreds of rebels to their death to save myself. What about your crew? The Federation? Our universe? Be massacred by Klingons? Sometimes the end justifies terrible means. Hinting again that this Lorca is actually the mere universe version and would want to kill any resistance to the Empire that he hopes to one day take over. But he is unable to convince Burnham to do so because she pushes back and he has to keep his own cover as her captain. It's in this moment that we can see that Burnham has truly not changed despite Lorca's best effort to get her to enact fascism unquestioningly. It's an unshakable union of species. Klingons, Vulcans, Andorians, Tellarites. It's the closest to a federation this universe may ever see. What's your point? My point is that a Klingon leads the Alliance. A Klingon. They rally behind him. If we can walk away from this, with the means to successfully negotiate with the Klingon race, that's real hope for finding peace at home. Burnham's willingness to jeopardize her own cover and life to protect a resistance that she sees as this universe's closest analog to the Federation is a perfect representation of the hope that Burnham still holds in her heart, despite her telling herself that she's failed to live up to Starfleet's ideals repeatedly since the Battle of the Binary Stars. Again, tying the performativity concept to this season's overall themes going back to the pilot. The trip to go and meet the Resistance is fun as well. I love that it's on location shooting, something that we don't get much in Star Trek anymore, given that they use the volume for practically any alien planet that we see nowadays. Sadly, the Coalition itself is a bit underdeveloped. I would have loved to see so much more of them if we had more time in the Mirror Universe, but it is fun to see a Mirror Universe Sarek in a standard Vulcan Mirror Universe goatee getting flustered after mind-melding with Burnham and seeing the Prime Universe in her memories. Even further, I loved seeing Burnham fascinated by a Mirror Universe Klingon, aka Voke, being the leader of a diverse coalition. With her questioning Voke on how he was able to incorporate working within a pluralistic group into his Klingon beliefs. Something that she could then take back to her own universe to hopefully open a dialogue with the Klingons that the Federation is currently at war with. That you honor the ways of your race. Yet here you are speaking in a foreign language, placing your faith in the cultural customs of others. I am here. I have survived only on the shoulders of my comrades. <laughs> However, this does lead to our Tyler, shocked by seeing his alternate self, activate his Voke side, lashing out at his mirror self for, in his eyes, perverting Klingon ideology of purity that Tyler has subscribed to his entire life. Tyler!
Burnham's. This is what leads to eventually Tyler revealing himself to Burnham in a tense moment, forcing Burnham to potentially kill someone that she cares about to keep her cover, again being tested to see if she's become a true fascist. I also do love that Burnham is only saved from Tyler by the Mirror Universe Saru, showing that Burnham's respect for his personhood, despite him being seen as a slave, leading him to want to save her when he might not have otherwise. Eventually though, despite Burnham feeling betrayed by Tyler, manages to send a secret signal to Discovery and, as our Saru says, lets Tyler stand trial under Starfleet law for his crimes, not Terran Empire law, showing the episode's final point of Burnham's connection to others allowing her to stay true to her beliefs even in moments of intense fear and trauma. Given that she learns in this episode that Voke was instrumental in having killed her mentor, Jojo. You were there on that bridge. I remember. Speaking of Jojo though, the episode's final destruction of the coalition, coupled with the reveal of Michelle Yeoh being the emperor, is a bit sad, given that it feels like you could have done more with this resistance movement, and why I wish we had actually gotten more time in the Mirror Universe if this was the arc that they wanted to tell. But alas, we gotta speed run this story apparently. Still, it's always great to see more Michelle Yeoh. Stemitz's storyline in this episode is mostly just set up for him entering the mycelial network next episode, but it still ties into the themes of connection with Tilly, who has had a growing bond with Stemitz all season, who is ultimately the one to understand Stemitz's mushroom research enough to use it to save his life. Again, this is showcasing how our relationships are what tether us to each other and to our lives, a true Star Trek theme. Also, we get a ton of fun Star Trek techno babble here, and I love the idea of mushrooms being a gateway for the mind to be able to enter other worlds. It's super trippy, and I'm sure Carl Sagan would have approved. In the end, this is a fantastic episode overall that really fundamentally builds on the season's ideas of how societies are built by what they ask their citizens to perform, which will lead us full circle back to the Klingon War and what the Federation is becoming because of that war as a result in the end of this season. This also nicely ties back to the deconstructing of the Klingons' ideals of racial and ideological purity by showcasing that Klingon philosophy is not inherently supremacist, but that the wholeness of Klingon culture can be incorporated into a pluralistic society without sacrificing its depth and meaning, something that Prime Universe Tyler, as well as Klingons like Takuma, were still wrestling with and ultimately pushing back against. In the end, this episode honestly just makes me wish the season had had more time to spend in the Mirror Universe instead of having to share half of it with the Klingon War arc, which, while they both do bounce off of each other really well thematically, feel like they could have been their own full seasons each. But still, this makes for another great episode of Season 1 of Star Trek Discovery, and I'd love to hear all your thoughts down in the comments below. Did you like the world inside? Did you not like it? I'd love to hear all of it. But beyond that, my friends, I hope you all live long and prosper.